before we do our story, let me invite you to pause a moment. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, as always, we want to thank you so much for taking such good care of us throughout the week and uh, providing such a wonderful day to come together and to open your book. Thank you for all the instruction, the insight that uh, you have revealed. Uh, it's, it's a transcript of the great love that you have for us, and so we want to thank you uh, that you love us so much, despite the fact that we're sinful human beings. And so we're asking, Lord, that you forgive us of our frailty, of our sin, and that you'll work in our lives as never before, particularly as we see the day fast approaching. And we, we do see, Lord, uh, just spectacular events occurring in the world, and we know that, that uh, you're going to work through the circumstances, protecting your people and using us to fulfill the Gospel Commission. Help us to, to uh, not get sidetracked, but to accomplish what, what, you, what you set in motion so long ago. So use us in the finishing of your great work and bless those who are worshiping you today, we ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And, um, amen. Okay, so we're... Uh, I think we're in the last chapter, aren't we? I don't know. It says 83%. We'll see. Okay, so we getting close. coming along here. And of course, this is something that we do every week. We start out with a little inspirational story. And I uh, hope the folks uh, that, <clears throat> that tune in enjoy that as well as much as we do. We get so lots there. of comments about the story. Nice. They don't, they don't like it when they miss it or if something doesn't get it recorded. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is called The Return Home. When Carl, Willie, Eric, and Franz drove through the gates of the prison camp, they cheered their good fortune to have fallen into the hands of the humane Americans. I'll stay with the truck, Franz said to the other three. Why don't you guys go look for other pioneers? Lord, he prayed while the busy camp life bustled past his windshield. You have kept your promise. You alone deserve praise and thanks for bringing me alive through the dangers of war. I will never forget your goodness. Then he rummaged in the back of the truck, got out the box that contained the army records, and started balancing the accounts and closing the books. Achtung, Achtung, blared the loudspeaker the next morning, calling the battalion of which the pioneers were a part of to line up for roll call. Several units showed up, but the entire fourth unit was missing in action and presumed dead. Not all of the pioneers had reached the camp, either. Hop Mimikas told the remaining ones, to show up at Franz's barracks that evening after supper. Here Franz gave each man the last service pay due him and the service record, his service record. Look, Willie, he said, all the men are hungry. The Americans just don't have the kitchen staff to prepare food for so many soldiers. Why don't you do the cooking for our own company again? Good idea, Willie said, and the next day he went to the camp kitchen and brought back vegetables and potatoes. These he mixed into a thick stew and supplemented it with pancakes made from flour they'd brought all the way from Romania. Meanwhile, Franz went to the cashier of the battalion and turned over the accounting records and the remaining cash for which he received a receipt. He had done his duty faithfully and well. Then he and Carl divided the other goods among the men, sugar, sunflower oil, and enough cigarettes to give each man a suitcase full. Attention please, the loudspeaker crackled a little over a week later. Would all men going to Frankfurt report for discharge? All men going to Frankfurt, please report immediately. Carl, Franz said, I'm not going yet. I'm going to see that heap of rubble soon enough, and I want to finish up here. I'm not packed yet anyway. Tonight I'll get my things together so I'm ready for the next call. So Carl, Willie, and Eric also decided to stay. After supper, Franz carefully laid out his belongings. In addition to the food items, he had brand new pairs of pants and boots he had bought in Romania. My discharge clothes, he had told the others. Then he packed his rucksack, his bread bag, and his laundry sack with his belongings. Out of burlap, he sewed a cover for a five-gallon canister filled with sunflower oil so that only the handle showed. When he finished, his goods weighed 150 pounds. Two days later, the loudspeaker again called for men returning to Frankfurt. The four friends ran to say goodbye to Halp Mamikas, who as a higher officer was required to stay. They picked up their things and started on the five mile hike to the discharge center. After only a short distance, Franz stopped. He was panting and sweat pouring down his face. Friends will never make it like this. 
Carl, run back and borrow our company's bicycle. We can return it later. Carl soon returned. They hung the rucksacks on the handlebars, draped the laundry sacks over the frame, and tied the oil containers to the narrow carrier on the back. <laughs> Franz steered and Carl pushed while the other two kept things balanced. Now they made good progress. Other soldiers had found their loads too heavy and left most of their belongings behind. So finally they reached the discharge camp. Here a German major with a megaphone ordered everybody to form a column. When he saw the four with the bicycle, he yelled, what are you doing with a bike? Aren't you going to line up? Quickly they laid the bike on the ground and fell in line. Then he barked, all SS men stepped to the left. Several men stepped out and were sent back to the main camp with a guard. The rest were led to a train in which the discharge center had been set up. In the first car, a doctor conducted a physical exam. After the men undressed, he took their blood pressure and listened to their heart and lungs. Finally, he said to each one, lift your right arm, good. Lift your left arm, good. You may get dressed. Franz, totally confused by this maneuver, watched curiously as the others went through the routine. When it was Sergeant Eric's turn to lift his arms, Franz noticed he had a number tattooed on the underside of his arm. Aha, the doctor said, we caught one. SS men will not be released. Please wait outside for a guard. Eric, Franz said when the four men gathered back at the bicycle, I never knew you belonged to the SS. You were not even a supporter of the Nazis. What happened? Eric sighed. I joined the SS years before the war, he said, but then I got disillusioned and quit. When the war came, I volunteered to fight in the regular army. I guess since I'm going back to the camp, I'll return the bike. And sadly, the friend said goodbye. Franz, Carl, and Willie took their discharge papers to the railroad car for a final approval. Stand at attention, said the American colonel behind the table. The men stiffened. Out of habit, Carl, who had been a strong opponent of the Fuhrer, stretched out his right arm and said, Heil Hitler. <laughs> the colonel glared at him, shocked and revolted. Discharge denied, he growled. <laughs> now, he said, turning to Franz, give me your papers. After glancing at them, he said in fluent German, I see in your service record a notation that you are to be court-martialed after the war. Yes, sir. Franz had studied this entry closely. What did you do to earn this? I refused an order for religious reasons. I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and I keep the Sabbath holy, as the Bible asks us to do. Once on my day of rest, there was an attack, and I refused to do duty because it was the Sabbath. <coughs> Wait a minute. <coughs> Colonel's eyebrows and voice showed incredulity. You can't be serious. All through the war, you kept the Sabbath in the Nazi army and you survived? Yes, sir. God protected me, even in the German army. That's amazing, said the colonel. I'm a Jew myself, by the way. But even in the American army, I don't keep the Sabbath because it's too difficult. Colonel Franz said boldly, I recommend that you keep the Sabbath. I suppose I really should, he responded. But still shaking his head in amazement, he continued with the interview. What is your occupation? I'm a minister of the gospel and a coal porter. I sell religious books door to door. I'm sorry, we're only allowed to release farm workers at this time. Do you know anything about farming? Well, from 6 to 14, I lived with my grandfather. He was a farmer in southern Germany, so I know how to do all the farm tasks. The colonel shook his head. I can't make that work. Your experience isn't current. Suddenly he had an idea. Do you by any chance have a garden? Yes, we have a small garden in Frankfurt. That'll do, he, <laughs> he scrawled, <laughs> writing something on the paper. I hereby discharge you to work in the vineyard of the Lord. <laughs> Beaming, he handed the papers back to Franz. On them he had written, Agricultural Inspector. <laughs> Soon American trucks arrived, and Franz was the first one on as Willie handed up their luggage. Franz quickly mm -hmm. stowed it under the seat so it wouldn't be so conspicuous. Now they were on their way. The men had learned that every few days a convoy of trucks drove to Luxembourg to transport food supplies to the prison camp. On the return trip, the trucks were loaded with released prisoners of war. Two drivers, taking turns, reached Frankfurt in 24 hours. On the city's outskirts, the men got off. It was May 21st, 1945. Franz was free. Excuse me. Of the original company of 1,200 pioneers, only seven survived. Mm -hmm. Only three of those were not wounded. Franz Hassel, the man with the wooden pistol, was one of the three. <laughs> Barely two weeks earlier, the wild ringing of the Eskenrod church bells awakened Helene. Outside, she could hear people running and shouting. 
Herr Straub pounded on her door, yelling, Frau Hassel, Frau Hassel, come down. She threw on some clothes and rushed out. In the street, she saw Germans and Americans laughing and crying and embracing each other. That was May 8, 1945, and the war was over. The villagers were told that Hitler had committed suicide, Germany had capitulated, and the Allied forces had divided the country into four parts. Eskenrod was the American occupied zone, and until a government could be established, they were to obey American regulations. And until further notice, none of the evacuees from the cities were to return home. Children, children, come into the house, Helene called them. Back in their room, the little family knelt with full hearts and thanked God for bringing them safely through the war. But where's Papa, whispered Lottie as the prayer concluded. Is he still alive? Please, God, Helene prayed, bring him back to us. Slowly, the days and weeks passed. Things weren't that much different from the war's final weeks, except that no longer did the burning city of Frankfurt cast an orange glow against the night sky. The children attended school and helped in the fields, since there were so few people left who could work. No word had come from Papa in a long, long time. His last letter had been posted from Russia's Caucasus Mountains, and it was being whispered that German soldiers caught there had been sent to Siberian labor camps. On the outskirts of Frankfurt, Franz and Willie stared at the heap of luggage piled on the sidewalk around them. Willie, there's no way we can carry this, the older man said. You stay here and guard it while I try to find something to haul it in. Franz was shocked to see the destruction of the city. Later he learned that 80% of Frankfurt had been leveled. Here and there, women were digging through the rubble for still usable utensils. A boy was knocking mortar off bricks so they could be recycled. Coming toward him, Franz spotted an old man pulling a wooden hand cart. This was exactly what he needed. Excuse me, is this your cart? Yes, it is. We've just been released from prison camp and we have a lot of things to transport. If you'll lend us your cart, I'll give you your choice of 100 marks or five pounds of cigarette tobacco or half a liter of sunflower oil. We'll return the cart in a few days. The man studied him closely. Well, I'm on my way home from the train station. I found some coal there, if you know what I mean. No problem, he said. I'll accompany you home and help you unload the coal. The man agreed. By the way, I would like to have the oil. The man never asked Franz's name or address, but willingly loaned him the wagon. When Franz took it back to Willie, they loaded their belongings and covered them with a tarp to protect them from prying eyes. Then pushing and pulling, they made their way through the rubble. Oh no, Willie said, I see that we're not going to make good time. Why's that? Look who's coming, the wives. Seeing the soldiers, women converged from all directions. Their emaciated bodies and tattered clothes told the story of the ravages of war at home. Silently, they looked at the men with eyes full of hope and dread. Then the questions began. Where do you come from? We're from the Eastern Front, Willie said. My husband was there too, one of the women said, and others echoed with their own questions, calling out name after name. Have you seen George Snyder? Have you any news of Heinrich Gerber? Look, ladies, be reasonable, the two men responded. We can't know everybody who fought in Russia. <laughs> Franz turned to Willie. If this doesn't stop, we'll never get home. From now on, we say we recently arrived from Austria. <laughs> Another woman headed in their direction. Where are you from? We just got here from Austria. My youngest boy, Hans Kimmel, was there. <laughs> I haven't heard from him in months. My other three sons fell in Russia. Do you know anything? No, we're sorry. We don't know that name. We have no news. Franz, this isn't going to work, Willie said. Let's just try saying we arrived from prison camp. <laughs> American soldiers were stationed at all the bridges they had to cross. Each time they had to show their papers. The documents were in order, but the GIs eyed the cart suspiciously. However, no one objected. Another woman came running after them. Where are you from? We are just released from prisoner of war camp. What unit were you with? Pioneer Park Company 699. My husband was too. Do you know Ludwig Keller? Frau Keller, Franz said, your husband was on the same truck with us. He may already be standing at your front door and can't get in. With a scream of joy, the woman turned and ran. Willie Franz said a little later, let's go to my apartment first. It's still all the way across town, but it's closer than yours. That's all right with me if it's all right with you. So in the evening, they reached their goal. And after seeing section after section of the city leveled, it came almost as a shock to see the block of six large apartment buildings intact, 
Like a huge fortress, they rose above the rubble. As Franz and Willie hauled the cart into the entry, a neighbor stuck her head out the door. Herr Hassel, you're back. Welcome, a thousand times welcome. You're one of the first men to return. Frau Jekyll, I'm so heart glad to see you. Your family is not here. They are in Eskenrod. Franz was befuddled for a moment. Eskenrod? You know, the village in the Vogelsberg Mountains. He nodded and sighed. Thank you very much, and a good day to you. Franz opened the door with his key that he'd kept all through the war. He and Willie unloaded the cart, and while Willie took a bath, Franz looked the apartment over. The windows were broken and the curtains flew in the wind, but nothing was missing. The furniture, the bedding and dishes and books, even Franz's pre-war motorcycle parked in the spare room were all there. Later, Franz learned that Polish, uh, Polish prisoners of war had stayed in the elementary school a quarter mile away and when they'd been liberated, they had looted freely and taken anything that was not nailed down. Evidently, God held his hand over the hostile apartment. <laughs> Finally, Franz bathed and shaved, and after they'd eaten a meal, they retired for the night. What a luxury to be in one's own bed again. The next morning, the friends said a warm goodbye, and Willie left for his home in the Taunus Mountains, leaving half his things in the apartment to pick up later. Knowing his family was probably quite safe in the remote village, Franz walked the eight miles down to the conference office to report back, and the conference president welcomed him. Brother Hossel, you're the first conference employee back from the war, he exclaimed. Could you help us a while as a pastor? We're in desperate need because many of my men have lost their lives. There's no publishing work at the moment. In fact, we don't even know if the publishing house is still standing because there are no trains, no mail, no phones. I'll tell you what, Franz said, if God needs me to be a pastor, I'll be a pastor. But my family isn't here, and I haven't seen them in a long, long time. Let me go and bring them back, and I'll be ready to start the 1st of July. Brother Hossel, you can't imagine how grateful I am. God bless you. So the following day, Franz returned the handcart to his owner, along with the promised oil, and began the 40-mile journey to Eskenrod. The miles stretched endlessly. He spent one night in a barn and continued on. Finally, a signpost said, Eskenrod, five kilometers. Franz stopped at a clear brook in the woods, cleaned up and shaved, and when he heard a wagon rattling by on the road, he hailed the driver. Are you going to Eskenrod? The driver nodded. I live there. I'm just back from the war, said Franz. My wife is one of the evacuees there. Do you know a Frau Hassel? Oh, yes, she is staying with the mayor. Here, the driver said, climbing down, put your bags on the wagon. There's not quite room enough for both of us, so I'll walk with you the rest of the way. Some distance from the village, Franz saw a boy coming along the dusty road. The child shaded his eyes against the sun and looked toward them and suddenly started running. Papa, he screamed. Papa, you're back. He flung himself into his father's arms. Gerd, Franz said in a trembling voice, is this my little Gerd? Oh, I'm so glad, Gerd, glad. Gerd gasped. <laughs> All those G's. <laughs> I have, it looks different when you see it in writing and then when you're trying to read it out loud. <clears throat> I have been walking along this road every day hoping to be the first one to see you. I am so glad you're back. The driver chuckled. Hop on the wagon, son. And I guess I'd better get up beside you and make sure you don't run away with the horses. I'll walk, said Franz. I couldn't sit still for a moment. So on that cool May afternoon, Helene sat on the rough-hewn bench outside the farmhouse shelling peas. The older children were out playing with, while little Susie was floating pea shells in a pan of water. In the distance, she saw the neighbor returning from market in his wagon pulled by two horses. A tall, deeply tanned man followed some distance behind. Helene didn't know him and wondered where he was headed. Just then she noticed Gerd riding on the wagon seat beside the neighbor and smiling proudly. When they came alongside, the wagon pulled up and the neighbor said, Frau Hassel, I'm bringing you a visitor. I hope you are happy about it. Mildly surprised, Helene answered, It was very kind of you to give Gerd a ride. By this time, the tall stranger had caught up and was lifting some baggage down from the wagon. He approached while Helene stared into his dark brown face. Then the stranger started laughing and Helene recognized him. Children, she shouted joyfully when she could catch her breath. Come quickly, something wonderful has happened. Our Papa has come back. Papa is home. So after six years of war and separation, the Hassel family was back together again. 
And there's another chapter still beyond this, so I guess we get to go to next week. Okay. All right. We're only 89% of the way through, so I guess we're getting close. Right, so uh, quite a happy reunion there. I'm sure uh, so many families are devastated by losing someone. You in see the how world. many of his, his co uh, co workers yeah, call from his area. His other, other soldiers, only seven of them survived. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think he, well, of course they were probably in different, uh, different regiments and so forth. But. Uh, I think you yeah. would say there were 1,500 of them and only seven of them survived, or 1,300. That's a probably, lot of people to be in one group. In the Second World War, what, what were there? Uh, was there 50 million died in the Second World War, something like that? Yeah, that was in Vietnam, I think. No, that was 50,000. <coughs> My first cousin, I just attended his funeral. He fought uh, Normandy and all the way across Germany and Czechoslovakia. He was in the heat of it. Yeah, it's too bad they didn't have social media or the internet back then. People would have been able to find out about their loved ones, I guess, more quickly. That's one advantage, I guess, that we have today with communications. But uh, not only that, but what are they coming back to? They're coming back to nothing. Basically Most nothing. Done. Yeah, basically nothing. Just uh, interesting how interesting how God just preserved, you know, this uh, this particular fellow throughout the war, and even even the little story there with the discharge, where the colonel was interviewing him, you know, giving him all kinds of ways to get back. <laughs> right. You could tell that. I mean, this, he, he had a measure of respect for this person that um, reverenced the Bible. And so, uh, well, he went out of, he went, he went really the extra mile in making sure that he was able to get, you know, to get out uh, and go home as soon as possible. Excuse me. Got the yawning starting. <coughs> have a viewer in from, from Baltimore today. That's a day. Okay. Place. All right, well, great to have everybody here, and great to have you joining us online. Uh, whether you're watching <coughs> live or whether you catch one of our archive sessions, we're glad to have you with us. We do this every week. We, we come together and just have a Bible study on God's Sabbath, and so we're glad that you're here with us. Um, we're, <coughs> we're looking at the book of Matthew, uh, the very final section there. Jesus, Jesus has gone uh, to the cross. He, the blood has been <coughs> shed and applied to the mercy seat that uh, was secreted below 600 years before. And so the price for sin uh, has not only been paid, but he has also satisfied the demands, the, the aspect of the, of the law, the transgression of the law, by forfeiting his on the presence, an eternal presence to cover the transgression of an eternal law. Um, so at any rate, we have that, and then of course it's because of that that you have a resurrection. And there's something else that needs to occur before Jesus ascends back to heaven. And that's uh, some extra instructions in regards to things that had already been stated. But also, uh, what, what Matthew calls here the Great Commission, what, what Christians know as the Great Commission. <clears throat> uh, he's going to, to leave because he has to enter upon his second phase of uh, what I call the second phase of his priestly ministry, uh, having begun that, that first phase uh, while actually on the cross itself. And... Matthew just gives a little, in, in uh, 16, 17, 18, 20, just gives a, a little uh, summary of what took place here. So I'm going to just go ahead and read that, and then we'll take you somewhere else. But anyway, Matthew 28, 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. So obviously before he was, was uh, before he yielded his life at Calvary, 
he of course had been trying to tell them, I'm going to, you know, be uh, <clears throat> be crucified, and I'm going to be uh, risen on the third day, etc. They had talked about a place where they would gather, where they would meet. And uh, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, what do you, what is that all about? They didn't believe he'd be resurrected. <laughs> okay, some some doubted the whole the whole thing, right? They they just could not cope with the idea that uh, somebody rose from the dead. Somebody rose from the dead, and that uh, why wow, so, when they had seen it before? Only a couple of times, though. Yeah, they seen it. If when I he see it once, the dead. Yeah. Well, we'll go to some of the other Gospels, and they give it a little more detail concerning that. But it says here in verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so... After this, uh, what probably turned out to be somewhat brief encounter at the predetermined location, which was the Mount of Olives, okay, uh, he ends up ascending up into heaven. Okay. And uh, we can actually look at that in Acts, the first chapter. It's interesting that Matthew doesn't even mention that. You would have thought... I mean, if I had been standing there and you see this person just rise up, float up into the air, and just, you know, <clears throat> you would have thought that he would have mentioned that. But uh, well, maybe he wanted to put the emphasis on the what the mission was, not the fact that he went up, because that much would have been apparent. <clears throat> Probably so. In Acts uh, 1, uh, just in verse 4, there talks about being assembled together with them. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Now, this is interesting. This is kind of revealing, too. They ask him a question, right? What's the question that they ask him there in, in uh, verse 6? Acts 1, 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He's still expecting it. <laughs> still. still this, I mean, some of, these, uh, some of these teachings and ideas are just ingrained so deep into their hearts they can't really get past this idea, this notion that, you know, Messiah, when the Messiah came, he was going to restore Israel to its prominence. Well, I mean, from their perspective, why not now? Yes, why not now? You've because, done what you came here to do. Yeah. Are you going to now, now restore everything now? Yeah, now this should happen, right? Um, <clears throat> it would have been a real... How much of a letdown would it have been if he if he would have told them, "Hey, look, man, we got two thousand more years of human history yet to play out." Oh, they they, they just broke their heart. They had, they had crushed. They had to give up. They had crushed them, you know. I mean, John got to see how much later it was going to be. Only by what, maybe 70, 70 years, maybe. 65, 70 years. You know, I wanted to go back for a second. I was thinking as you were talking about those who had been resurrected and no mention being made of them rising up mm -hmm. when, when Jesus was ascended. But there was also a mention made about the wave sheaf. Now, when Jesus was resurrected, it said there were many of the dead that went into town and appeared to many. Right. But we also know that after his resurrection, he went back to heaven to make sure that everything was... Was acceptable. Now, in and the, then came back. But the day after Passover was days. when the wave sheaf offering took place, right. which was when he was. The symbolism would have been the first fruits. He may have taken those so people then. At that time, then. They may have been been taken to heaven at that point. Right. 
because there is not really any other mention other than the fact that they went into the city and appeared to many. Yeah, that's a that's a. So it's good possible that they, these were the these were the first fruits he presented because I was going through looking to see what the timing was on the wave sheaf and what that was because it's kind of murky, but it said that this was done. You know, the first fruits was the the first of the harvest, and that's what these resurrected ones were. Right. They were kind of the first fruits could of the that harvest. Could be the four and twenty elders. It could be. I mean, they could be. It says they have crowns on their head. They're wearing white, right, white robes. Because they cast their crowns before Jesus' feet. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and of course, the number itself is significant. But I mean, certainly, that could be part of that group, if not the entirety. But we're not told how many were resurrected or anything. Right. It just, just said many. many were. Nobody defines the number of many, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. But since they went to heaven, they could be the four and twenty elders that cast their crowns before Jesus' yeah. feet. It's just an interesting speculation. We don't really have any answer <clears throat> to it. But I was just thinking in terms of him fulfilling everything, it makes sense if he had to go and make sure his offering was acceptable that this was also the symbolism of those first fruits, so he probably would have taken them with him when he went that first time. Well, well now, whenever the earthquake happened, that is death. Wouldn't it? When they was r resurrected and went into yes. the sea? The second earthquake, when he was resurrected with the second earthquake. The second. So they were raised at the same time he was. Right. So apparently when, the, when he died, the, and the earthquake occurred that opened a lot of the graves. And then three days later, or that, that, that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, when the uh, other earthquake occurred and he was resurrected, they were resurrected with him. With so. But I mean, you know, I mean, obviously he didn't go back to the, till that evening, so that would have given him just that rest of that day, the whole day, pretty right. much, to go in and... And I, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I'm thinking the only way that would have been significant enough for people to, to take them seriously would have been if they were people that were recognized by those who were currently living. In other words, they would have been people that had died relatively recently rather than ancient patriarchs that nobody, somebody rises from the, rises from the dead and says, I'm Moses or I'm whoever, you know, Samson, I'm Samson, Samson or something. Yeah. Well, you've never met him, so how would you know? You know, it would probably be more more of a, a characteristic that it would have been somebody that people recognized. I think it was a combination of probably both. I think there were probably some, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I mean, they, they, they all could have been come out of the cave of Machpelah there. And if, <clears throat> if people knew where they had been buried and went over there and saw that there was no longer any remains in there. Like, man, those disciples were busy stealing all sorts of bodies. <laughs> Yeah, well, you could have definitely come to that conclusion. Yeah, body snatching. That's where that movie came from, right? Yeah. So, so it could have been a combination of both. I say, uh, it's just interesting speculation. When you thought, though, that, that at his resurrection, that he wouldn't have thought that he had had to go back to heaven and see if everything was okay, it would automatically have been okay because he was resurrected. Well, we know that David wasn't among those resurrected. That's one guy to rule out. All right. Um, I, I don't think when it comes to something so significant like this that you would just assume that everything... But it happened. had to be. There was no other way around it. If he was resurrected, everything was okay. <clears throat> yeah, I would, I would have... Um, I mean, in, in knowing the things that we know today from a theological standpoint, yes, the, the, there's a legality there that the resurrection can only occur as long as the blood was applied to the mercy seat. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, and it may not have been that he needed to go and make any presentation. It may have been after he'd been separated from the Father. He, he just needed wanted to go, go and spend He wanted time to go see him. Dad. You know, he wanted to go home well, yeah. to see him again. But here's well, the other thing. There when Murray, uh, Does Jesus told. even know? See, he knows that the, the way it's supposed to work is in the temple. He knows he wasn't crucified in the temple. Does he even know that the thing is under Golgotha? You see what I'm saying? He... 
so there may be a little bit of a, um, I, I, and probably what you're saying is true that it was just this. I mean, how how long had they been apart? Thirty-three years. Well, in in that sense, yes, but I mean, Plus. even yeah. more so, yeah. they had you know the father had turned away while he was on the cross. Yeah. And so, man, I, I would definitely twenty four hours. I would definitely be motivated to want to go and make sure that everything is is the way that it should be. Well, what did he tell Mary? Don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my Father, but I uh, what did he say? I ascend to him to him, and because uh, he hadn't been what he called cleansed or something. He's going to be cleansed right. to his father and then come back. Yeah. Well, when you're resurrected with a glorified body, I don't think you can get any more cleansed than that. Well, that's uh, I might not be saying, but he was yeah. going how to say to How long was he there before he came back and appeared to the disciples? Seven, Why did he, he say? seven days. So seven days. There might be there's something symbolic in the sanctuary. Service well, that was that seven day period too. Well, that was one of the requirements for priestly ministry. And remember, when he was going to eventually go back, he was going to enter into the second phase of his priestly ministry. So this was kind of like a qualifying aspect, which is the same thing Aaron and his sons had to go through. You can read. The, I think the there, I think there was a seven day waiting period. Waiting period where they right. had to be fasting and they had and they had to spend it in the holy place. In other words, it was part of their priestly requirement among being washed and being anointed with oil and anointed with blood and all this stuff. They had to spend seven days in the, in the holy place. That was part of the, the, the ritual aspect of it. And so here, Jesus is doing the very same thing. He's resurrected, and now he's, he's spending time in the holy place, and then he's coming back, you see. And then he's going to spend, what, forty total of 40 days... <clears throat> was he 40 days on the earth then before he was taken up? Yeah, and, and of course he's, he, he, has to, he has to get, he has to get uh, across to these guys. No, Kenny, what happened was he was resurrected. He spent one day here. He spent, then he went up to see the Father. He was up there for a week. He came back. So he actually, after he came back, he spent 32 days here going around and talking with the disciples. Right. Right. Then, after that, see that made a total of 40 days. Then he told the disciples, said, Terry here for 10 days. Right. So that was Pentecost. And, and that made 50 days total. Then the Holy Spirit descended upon them. Right. So very good. We're going to get Edersheim's book this week and see what we can find on that for next week. Very good. Okay, so uh, Jesus responds to that question in verse 7 here in Acts 1. It's not, for, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You know, wait a minute now. You know, now they, they were, the disciples were correct. They... Everything had been fulfilled, and when they said, now are you going to set it up, that was their expectations. Of course. Because everything had been done, everything had been fulfilled, everything, they didn't see the, the overall blueprint. Right. Or his timetable. Right. But it was natural for them to assume, hey, you've so. done accomplished everything you said, now we're going to set this thing up. Yeah, I think it was quite natural for them sure. to assume that. Particularly since they had been trained and educated uh, to have that expectation anyway. Uh, but like you said, they didn't understand that salvation is really a marriage ceremony and it's all set up on a six to one ratio. So there would, there would in totality, be a, per a, a period of 6,000 years of sin and probation for humanity. And then, of course, the thousand year millennial period uh, gives you the six to one ratio of the, the total 7,000 year period. The closer we get to the end of time and the end of the 6,000 period, the more knowledge and understanding we see, the more that is revealed to us. Sure. And there's a specific reason why. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's kind of a, 
we think about it, but uh, if we really knew when he was coming, everybody would wait until <coughs> a week or two before he comes to get rid of him. Yeah, that's the way we are. <coughs> <coughs> but anybody's probation can close in any time. Right? Yeah. So well, I think it's, it's cool important to be ready at any time. What's going on? But the important thing is he comes back to get these guys ready for an emphasis on the mission. I mean, you know, while he was living and preparing for what he was going to do, the important aspect had to be on the sacrifice and the sacrifices, dual sacrifice, and what was going to be accomplished there. Now it's all about, okay, we, we need to enter into this phase where the world has to be informed about the plan about the plan of salvation. And so that's why in Matthew, you know, it's just stated as a commission to do what? <clears throat> go and teach all go, nations. Yeah, go and basically share all the things that... Do what I did with you. He was going to emphasize, particularly over those 40 days, make disciples of all nations. Bap baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things that I command to you. Is that going on today? No, of course, let's, well, let me just back up a second. Back in the first century, was that accomplished? It was going it on. It was being accomplished. It was being accomplished, okay. What was, what was Paul's assessment after a number of years had gone by? <clears throat> Paul's assessment was simply that the world had been informed. The gospel had gone to mm -hmm. the entire world. And that's why the disciples, and well, Paul, who, who wrote, you know, a third of the New Testament, that's why he definitely believed that, okay, you know, when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, mm -hmm. then the end shall come. Okay, okay, but wait now, stop. Now, what did he perceive to be the entire world? It wasn't, he was not looking at Japan or Korea or anything like that. In the first century. He was looking at only the areas that pertain to the Jews. In the first century, world population, anybody know what it was? Close to, I don't know, what, a million or so. 250 million. In the first century, okay. 150 million. 250 million. The what? historians estimate was the world population. Wow. 25 percent, one fourth of all of those people lived in the Roman Empire. Okay, so you got 25 percent of the world population living under Roman rule to start with. Okay. Well, Roman rule ruled the world according to them. Yes. Yeah, Rome was it for you know hundreds and hundreds of years, and of course they had an east and a west type thing. But but uh, with that kind of concentration of people, it would have been, I would have, I mean it, it would have been I think quite not easy, but uh, it would have been a, 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 an achievable accomplishment. Because if you reach a quarter of the world's population, they're going to have tentacles that reach out to the rest of the world. Well, and you're looking at six, six million two hundred fifty thousand. So it, you're looking at the size of New York, pretty close to the size of New York being the Roman Empire. Well, here's the other thing in Psalm 19, <clears throat> verse one, it says, "The heavens declare the glory of God and." Firmament shows his firmament handiwork. showeth his handiwork. Okay, so you have not only the scriptures that have been fulfilled, and of course this is, and of course you, they're they're during this time they're writing the New Testament. Okay, until we get, I mean that that occurs all the way up to like 100 A.D. when John 90 or 100 A.D. when John is writing the Book of Revelation. So you've got all this, you got all this highlighted information from a contemporary perspective based on Old Testament prophecy. You know, m much of the New Testament, of course, as you know, is just a, a repeat, a repackaging of the Old Testament, what we call the Old and the New, right? Same message, same plan, same everything, concepts, 
It's just kind of repackaged uh, primarily by Paul. Much of it is, is, a, is quoted from Quite, the Old yes, Testament. It's, it's, yeah, they're just rehashing I would say, in a way, it's mostly just explaining stuff from the Old Testament. Yes. I, I would Maybe magnifying it and, and magnifying. expounding on it a little more. Yeah, putting it in some more relative terms for them. All right. So, kind of like what we're doing now. So the gospel goes to the entire world. Uh, I would say certainly uh, by probably 200 A.D., you know, they, they could have, I mean, Paul is writing his assessment, I think, like around 60 A.D., uh, that the gospel had gone to the entire world. You know, that was his, his perspective. And so certainly, that's why in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, right? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when he's talking about the, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up. He expected, he expected the Lord to come back very soon, and he, he, certainly in his lifetime. Okay, but again, what they didn't know then was not necessary for them to know, and that's what Jesus says right here. It's not necessary for you, you know. Um, it is not for it's you not, to know it's not for times. you to know the times or the seasons that the fathers put. Okay, it wasn't necessary for them to know it because it would be hundreds of years later. Well, it didn't pertain to them. It didn't pertain to them, really. He didn't, he didn't see. He couldn't see. It. That's what it did. Okay. So what we're, what we're experiencing in a global aspect is the same thing that we've talked about many times with the duality of things. In other words, the gospel message went to the entire world one time already. Mm -hmm. It will happen again. It will be repeated. Okay? On a and much larger scale. Well, and why do you say that? Not because of geography. I'm just thinking because of the huge number of people. Population. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think we're at 8 billion or approaching Close 8 to that, yeah. I think they're all getting it. A lot of them just ain't going to accept it. Okay. All right, so... So anyway, so we're, we're, we're kind of coming around a second time. Now, uh, look at the technology we have to reach people virtually anywhere on the planet at any time. Right? See, even, even, in even, even these kind of Here we are. We're, we're streaming live, and there are people that join us. Uh, we get reports on our, our streaming and whatnot. Do you know that there are people from 30 different countries? that have watched our little uh, meeting here from 30 different countries. Look at there. Look, you see, you see, it's you amazing. Can, this could come from communist countries and know then the communists cannot do anything about it now. They could stop preachers from coming in. Sure. They could stop radio signals from coming in right. or TV, but they can't stop the internet. They can't stop at 3 God's going to find the ones that are yes. sincere in heart, right? He's going to find the ones that are sincere in heart. All right, now, in order to accomplish such a monumental task of confronting the world, right, God has, of course, uh, left us with some tremendous assets. You know, I, I liken this to the gold. The Bible says in Revelation 3, you know, buy of me, Jesus says, buy of me gold, white raiment, and I said. I liken that gold to, of course, gold is an asset, right? And I, I liken... Uh, the, uh, the things, the tools that he's left us, uh, i.e., many of these discovery sites are simply tools that he's left us to help us, to assist us in reaching the world. Uh, I might not be able to share with somebody personally the story of Noah's Ark or Sodom and Gomorrah or the Red Sea Crossing, but they could come across that information, especially out there on the Internet now, from any number of hundreds of websites that have been produced and, and so forth. So uh, that's an incredible tool that's being used. But there's something else I wanted to also mention here, <coughs> and that moves us to, I want you to turn back to the Gospel of Mark. Go to the Gospel of Mark here. There's another aspect that we need to consider here. Mark chapter 16. Uh, 
Okay, chapter 16 starts out with uh, uh, the fact that he has risen. It talks about, you know, Mary and, the, and, and so forth going to the tomb early in the morning. And uh, when you get down to verse 14, you have again uh, something similar to Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Okay, he uh, says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. That's a little bit different than what uh, Matthew says, where they just, you know, he says they doubted. Well, here, he's actually rebuking them for their, uh, their unbelief. Okay? Um, this has always been an issue for God's people, you know. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the spies that went out to spy the land, and they came back, you know, I mean, they, 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 had, they had left Egypt, of course. They're on their way to the promised land. They eventually get to a place where God tells them to send out the spies. They send out the spies, and they come back. And what, are the, what are, overwhelmingly, what do the spies say? Well, we can't do it. We can't do it. Only one agreed that they could. Caleb. Two. Two. Caleb, Caleb, Caleb and Joshua are the only two. That's who you were thinking of, right? Uh, yeah, but I yeah. thought he was only one. Caleb and Joshua, two of them. Uh, and, and they're the only two that make into the promised land. Yeah, they're the only two from the original ones that left Egypt. That's, that's astounding right there. But uh, uh, anyway, unbelief, right? Unbelief. Uh, back in the 1800s, there was a great awakening, a great religious awakening. Uh, I believe that Jesus wanted to come back in the 1800s. But, again, it was unbelief from God's people that where God said, okay, back into the wilderness. Remember when the spies came, came mm -hmm. back and that God's people had to go spend, what, 40 more years in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So all those people that didn't believe passed away, and new generations grew up, their kids grew up and whatnot, and they're the ones that actually went in. Same thing today, back in the 1800s, Came up to that Canish Barnea, so to speak. Unbelief. Back into the wilderness we went. Now we're coming around a second time. So what will happen? What will happen the second time here? God will, Christ will come and we'll go into the promised land. So it's amazing to see all these parallels um, that you find there. Anyway, uh, unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. In other words, there were people that were there that had been told, hey, the Messiah is alive, he's been risen. Oh, I, I, I don't believe it. Remember the story of Thomas? Yeah. You know, Thomas, I won't believe it until I see it with my own my eyes. Finger in the, yes. Nail hole. All right, so Jesus says to them, continuing on here at Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? Now, of course, that's a, an interesting. Uh, you would have thought he would have said, go, go and preach the gospel to every person, every individual. But he says every creature, right? Uh, meaning, basically, the word there, the essence of that word is really creation, uh, the, the actual Greek word. And so what he's basically saying is, take the message to the entire planet, to my whole creation, okay? Okay. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now look at verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. Right? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, just like Jesus' Jesus' ministry, there will be signs that will follow the believers, right? Look at these signs here. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak in new tongues or different tongues. They'll take up serpents, and if they drink any, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll, be, they'll recover. It's a great testimony to what uh, Paul was doing. Is it pretty accurately? Because I mean, you know, he was bit by a serpent. Everybody was waiting to watch till he dropped dead, and <laughs> he didn't die. And... Right. The the apostolic, well, the commission that God left with those men originally was definitely being taken very seriously 
and they were out there ministering on behalf of their Lord. Okay? Some of them had seen him with their own eyes. And so that had to be very motivating. Yeah, Paul was bit. He just shook the snot. Yeah. Like off into the fire. Sure. sure. Didn't he bother? Because, because it's not that, you know, Paul's life is any more special than ours. But what's the important thing at that moment? The mission. The belief. The, the mission. The mission. Right? The mission. And so God steps in to work in behalf of those who are concerned about the mission. But, but you know, when you start looking around at these signs, I thought this was interesting. Um, in other words, when Jesus went out to preach, um, he recognized that in order to get to the mind, he had to, to minister in a very simple ways, in very significant ways to the people. In other words, um, anybody could come along and say, hey, I'm the Messiah, and the kingdom of God is at hand, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, but if they don't have clothes, if they don't have food, if they have a malady, if they have a disease, if they're sick, you know, that information is going to go kind of in one ear and out the other, right? And it depends on how you come, too. Right. You ain't going to get out here and walk around claiming that. We know how he's coming. One of the ways that people know that you care about them, truly care about them, and not just their, their temporal well-being or their physical well-being, but more importantly their spiritual well-being, is by the way that you minister to them. In other words, when we look at, at ministries today, I'm, not, I'm just going across the board, when we look at a lot of ministries today, um, what you could, they, they would technically fall under the category of big business. Big business. Big business. It's all about the donations. offerings. It's about the donations. It's about the money. It's big business. And a lot of these people in ministry, they're flying around in their corporate in their jets, you know, and they're living in their, they're living a lavish lifestyle, right? Boy, you uh, ain't kidding. One of them got five. Is that airplanes. is that the example? Is that the example of Christ? No. Um, the example of Christ would be, hey, I'm gonna, I, I don't need those things. Number one, uh, and I could use any resources that come in to benefit. The people that are out there that are that are in need. Okay, that's true ministry. Okay, uh, but today in our society, it's a big business. Ministry. All big them donations were for the poor, and where is needed. Yeah. Not to have five half million dollar houses. Or well, unfortunately, houses. Ken. Unfortunately, uh, even with charities, you know, if you do a, if you do some research on charities. I'm talking about some of these well-known charities that you would all, if I mention names, you would all recognize them. Um, the CEOs of most of these charitable organizations have, they get hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in salary, you know. There's, there's, in other words, if you give $10, $9 goes to administrate and pay for all the administration and the infrastructure. They and a, dollar, 10 a dollar, maybe ten per five or ten percent might go toward the, the cause. actual cause. Okay, but you got these people that are making these exorbitant salaries and whatnot, and and that that's not to me that is not a charitable organization. I'm not. You know, don't ask me to support a lavish lifestyle, and 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 only give you know, sometimes not even five percent to the actual cause that you're trying. So people just, you know, it's about advertising. You just say, hey, I'm going to go out there and help. I'm going to build schools, and I'm going to help the poor, and I'm going to do this and that, you know, and disaster relief or whatever. And, you know, people don't recognize that a lot of their money actually goes to the organizations and their salaries, salaries and this and that and the other thing. It's, it's That's what uh, 2020 came up on that uh, 
United Givers Fund. Yeah. Everything they take in, they only give 10% of it to the actual. Yeah, people uh, would be wise to really check into some of these things that they're mm -hmm. donating towards because a lot of the money, you know, I liken it almost to a lot of these dictators in other countries where we send over a lot of relief for mm -hmm. something that happens. Mm -hmm. Well, not only do they take that relief food or, or material, and they use it to leverage, uh, they use it as a means of control, but they keep a lot of it for themselves, and, it, and, and very very little bit goes to the actual people who need it. So that's just the kind of, that's, that's what sin does to us. Sin causes us to be selfish and greedy. That is not what Jesus had in mind with the Great Commission. No. He said, I want you to go out and minister to people, and in doing that, these are the signs that will follow. Casting out demons, speaking in, in different tongues, uh, protection. You'll need protection from accidents. Um, in fact, every day that we're out there, every day that we're out there ministering to somebody, whether it's at, at our workplace or wherever it might be, every day that we're out there, you know, Scripture tells us that if it weren't for God's mercy and protection, we would be consumed. That's Lamentations chapter 3, verses 20, 20, uh, 1 and 2. If it wasn't for his faithfulness, we would simply be consumed. The devil, listen, you think the devil wants you out there sharing the good news with anybody? No. Absolutely not. And if he had it, if he, if he could, he would, he would just intervene and he would drop you as soon as he could, get rid of you as soon as he could. So angels of God, their ministry is to watch over and protect us, to assist us in, in helping to get the message out. But we've got to have that in our minds. We have to understand that that is the mission. That's the purpose. That's the purpose why we are believers, is to confront the world with the truth. Confront the world with the truth. Okay? Now, how do we do that? What are some of the ways that we can do that? I mean, when God opens the door for you to say something, you can get something said, but just volunteering a lot of times don't get you nowhere. Okay, well, a lot of times we run into strangers, and sometimes there are divine appointments where God has, God has kind of put us on a course, put us on a course to cross a path with somebody who needs some words of encouragement. Okay, it might that might be one thing. A stranger. What are other other things that we? What are feeding what are we someone, doing? clothing them, feeding uh, them, clothing them, be with them in need. Okay. But now it have to all be words. But but listen to these these things here, casting out demons. When's the wh wh where is the when's the where's the last demon possessed person that you've met? I mean, did you meet a demon possessed person last week? Very possibly. <laughs> okay. Of course, you don't, you don't know. In other words, what I'm saying is we, we may come across people that we don't know. We don't know their story. We don't know their lives. And they may be demon-possessed. We don't even know. How do we, how do we get to know? Cast out the demon. How do we get to know, you know? How do we interject ourselves into, you know, someone else's, <clears throat> someone else's they'll life? They'll say something to kind of give you a hint. You know what to say. I would say maybe <clears throat> learning to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and learning to be sensitive in those situations. Okay, we ourselves, what did Jesus do to prepare for his ministry on a day to day basis? Pray. And occasionally fasting. Every morning. Fasting, every morning. praying, spending time. With it. I mean, he was pleading with the Father <clears throat> show me where to go, give me the words to say. You know, he knew. He knew ahead of time, probably every day ahead of time, what was in store. But he went to the Father with a blank, a blank slate of paper and said, you just fill it in. You just fill it in. You know, where do I need to be today? You know, who do I need to be talking to? Who do I need to see? You know, what's their story? What's their, what's their uh, situation? All right? Then he already knows almost ahead of time, you see, because that's his main, his main focus is to minister to people. In fact, if you read in Scripture, you'll, you'll see this phrase, among the people, among the people, among the people. Jesus was always among the people. 
That's where he was. Okay? So part of our calling has to be we have to recognize that we need to be out there among the people and we have to have prepared ahead of time, pre-programmed our own minds so that we are sensitive to the people that we do meet. Okay? Now there are others that maybe we might know and we may know a little bit more about their story. What if they're ill? What if they're sick? What if they're disabled? You know, how can we help? You know, and and it, it's much much more difficult to reach a person spiritually with those spiritual gems if they're dealing with physical disabilities and issues and problems. Okay? So what Jesus recognized that that's why that's why at times he would perform miracles. Through the, through the Holy Spirit, uh, in order to dramatically alter a person's perspective in life, and boy, then they were open to whatever he was going to say to them. Okay? But these are the signs. If you go to Matthew 10, uh, well, let's see, Luke 9, 1 to 2. Let me just take you there. Since I'm open to Luke right here. Luke chapter 9. Um, he calls his disciples together, and he gave them power. Um, do all believers have a measure of power? Sure. Okay. How can, how can all believers have a measure of power? I mean, this talks about the disciples here sending out the twelve. But how can all believers have a measure of power? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. Right. We have no power of our own, but through the Holy Spirit we have power. Oh. It says an authority, an authority over all demons, and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Okay? And actually, I think um, the, the protocol would be the reverse of that. It would be to heal the sick and then preach the gospel. Because people are going to be a whole lot more uh, uh, willing to listen you can't do this if you're sitting there and your hands feel like it's coming off. Or if you, your stomach is killing you. Right. You, you, you paying too much attention to that instead. you got to take care of the other thing first. Something, something that we've looked at already in Matthew 10, that's going back a number, a number of weeks with Matthew 10. We find uh, a similar chapter here, Matthew 10, 7 and 8. Uh, telling the disciples, uh, well, Jesus sent out and commanded uh, the twelve disciples there. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter uh, a city of the Sumerians, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So go to my people first, right? They're preferred. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. <laughs> is, is that, I mean, where do you see today churches ministering in that way? Well, they used to have stuff on TV, Oral Roberts and them, and lay their hands on them. And they fall out they, like a tree. Yeah, and the biggest majority of that was hard to pay. Well, you can usually bet that if it's caught on camera, or if it's, you know, for your mega church, it probably is not a legitimate No. Miracle. They paid them to come in and do what you had. Right. We know that, that, that there is a lot. Well, because these scriptures are here, if you want to legitimize your church organization, you want to Perform make sure things. these things are happening. Or make people believe that they're or happening. make people believe that these things are happening. Because that brings in the <laughs> donations, you see. <laughs> but we know that, that people have been that organizations have been checked out, and we know that a lot of fraud occurs, which gives all Christians kind of a bad name. But still, back to my point, this stuff was happening in the first century. People were being healed, demons were being cast out, okay, diseases were. I mean, you know, these are the disciples, and not only was Jesus doing this, of course, daily daily basis. But his commission to the disciples is basically, well, I just said, hey, go and do as I've done. You've seen me heal the sick. You've seen me resurrect the dead. You've seen me. Yes. You've seen, you've seen, and, you've seen. And basically what he's saying is, 
I be my all authority is given to me to from give my to Father. Now I'm giving it to you. Okay. So what should be the expectation of any believing group? Any group of believers, what should be the expectation? That God would work through them in a similar fashion. Okay? Now does that mean that every person within a group, within a body of a group of believers is going to have all of these abilities? No. Okay. How does it typically, what's, what, what's the structure, how is it structured? We are the body. You know, we have different functions. And different gifts. Yeah. Different gifts. Different gifts, right? Um, and of course, when you go to Scripture, what are some of the gifts that you find in Scripture? Like the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. This is 1 Corinthians 12. This is Romans chapter 12. Prophecy. Prophecy. Okay. Discernment. You know, that's, that's the ISAB, right? The mm -hmm. Discernment. What? Teaching. Teaching, right? Different, Knowledge. Different languages. Wisdom, right? These are these are gifts, but also, also, gift of healing, healing. right? Also, the, the uh, which involves all kinds of things, cleansing. Well, of course, uh, here the cleansing lepers. But that would be in a, in a contemporary uh, aspect would be curing somebody from AIDS, lung disease, cancer. Uh, cancer. I mean, there's just a host of things, right? Lyme disease. Right? I mean, come on. You getting real or what? You know? What well, was Peter or was it Paul or the only one that raised somebody from the dead? The kid that fell out to wonder. Right. Eutychus. 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 Okay, so, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at a scenario that should exist. In fact, what did, what did Matthew call it? He said, these are the signs that will follow the believers. Right? You know, these are the signs. And so, why don't we see the legitimate signs taking place in church organizations today? I'd say one primary reason is disbelief, lack of faith. Lack of faith, okay. I think another, to some extent, might be the uh, personal sins people hold on to that keep the Holy Spirit from being able to fully empower you to do these things. That's the real thing I was going to. Second, in 2 Second Timothy 3, I want to show you something here. 2 Timothy 3, he says, but know this, that in the last days, what days? The last, last days. days. Where are we? The last days. We're right the there. Days. Okay, so, but know this, that right now, perilous times or dangerous times will come, will exist. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, boasters proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, head, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I He's read, talking, talking to the believers here. Yeah, I read just the other day um, that this generation is the most self-absorbed generation to ever exist. That we're so self-absorbed to the point that everybody thinks they need to have their own page to tell you everything about, about themselves. themselves right? <laughs> and that, you know. I know uh, it was a couple, number of years ago. Um, every, every year, the, di the dictionary companies come out and they add new words. And I remember it was a, what was it uh, 2008 or so? How does a dictionary company even stay like, alive? Like 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 ten years. It's like ten years ago. I don't know if it was quite ten years ago, but uh, selfie. Selfie was added to the dictionary. And again, total evidence that we are so so absorbed with ourselves, we gotta constantly take a picture of everything we do and how we're doing it and 
We want to we want to give recipes out of what we're eating for breakfast, you know. Take and, a picture of your food at your restaurant. <laughs> right. I mean, every hashtag it. as if someone it, it, as if someone needs to know, you know, what, what you had for lunch, yeah. and and then your assessment of it, you know, well, it tasted okay, it would have been better if it was. I mean, we are so absorbed on ourselves, you know, it's uh, astounding, but. Here, God's people have a mission to confront the world with the message of the gospel, right? And most churches, I would, would it be fair for me to say that in most churches, most church congregations, that they are void of the Holy Spirit? That's pretty harsh. I'd say it's pretty accurate. But, but why would I say that? Most of them got bands, they just go to listen to them. But why would I say that? Because they're not exhibiting the characteristics of... The signs aren't there. The, 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 the things that Matthew told us and Mark, and Mark told us that, that these signs would follow the believer. They're not there. Well, so what we have to realize too is that, well, right here, for example, only one out of 12 people even attend church. One in 12. No, that's, that's just... Uh, a uh, breakdown of population. Right. Okay. So Seven that's a... out of eight of the children quit church before the age of fifteen. One it is. If 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 the parents if the parents only go half the time, then you can bet their children, since they're a product of their environment, you can be assured that their children are only going to go twenty five percent of the time. And their children will only go 12% of the time. It's, they're a product of the environment, and it's getting worse and worse. And if you don't, if you don't train the kids to uh, growing up exactly what to believe and how to believe it, then, then they're, they're not going to teach their kids. They can only teach their kids what they've been taught themselves. If you don't come yeah. to an understanding that of your responsibility as a believer. A believer... And a parent. I'm just saying, your responsibility as a believer is to confront the world with the belief, with the belief of what the Messiah has done. Okay? That is job number one. Now, you might be a bricklayer. You may, you know, you may be an exercise instructor. You know, you may be a carpenter, you may be whatever you are, secretary, it doesn't matter. That's secondary. Job number one is a missionary. God, when you became a believer and when you came to the rec when you recognized what God had done for you, the sacrifices that he had made for you, and, and with the availability of uh, to be a citizen in the kingdom made new, you know, then you also became an ambassador of that same kingdom. And so foremost in, and this is why it's taken 6,000 years probably. <laughs> God knew that it was going to take so long for people to really come to an understanding of uh, that they needed to make job number one Evangelism. Missionary. Yeah, and evangelism, unfortunately, in the Christian community nowadays, evangelism is like the light switch on the wall over there. Turn it on, turn it off. Turn it on, turn it off. You know, we bring the evangelist, we, we schedule, you know, once, meetings. twice a year to bring the evangelist in because the evangelist is going to do the job. He's going to do what we can That do. we should be doing consistently every week, every day. You know. And so when you, when you have this on-off, this slight switch mentality of evangelism, uh, you're, you're missing, you're, you're missing the, the whole concept of really who you are. You know? And a lot of people... Uh, they may attend church on a weekly basis, but then they go out, you know, the, 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 the switch is turned on on that particular day, but then the rest of the week it's kind of turned off. It's, 
it's not, you know, their Christianity is not brought into their everyday life and their everyday thinking. And so when people see them, they might say, oh, this, you know, Joe's a nice guy, you know, he's friendly, etc. But they're not getting, uh, you know, Joe's not portraying what he needs to portray. He's not being a witness for the Lord on a, on a see what I mean? Being not, nice is not one of the qualifications. Right. Right. That has nothing to do with it. No. Okay. But uh, it'll be one of the evidences that you are. Right. Yes, it'll be an evidence, but it's not a qualification. Okay. So, so let me ask you a question now, because uh, you kind of touched on it earlier when you when we asked about you know what our real ministry objectives are. The Bible says you know that that uh, these signs will follow the believers. I mean, casting out demons, raising the dead, healing the sick, prophesying, etc., you know, speaking in different language, right? I mean, all those things are potential, potentially... Uh, uh, gifts that can be bestowed when necessary. Yeah, those things are all potentials in the life of a believer, right? However, the Scripture also says in, in James, in the book of James, for example... Um, it says that, uh, of course, it says, you know, be doers of the word, <clears throat> not hearers only. And, of course, you have a lot of people that are just hearers. But verse 27 says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To cast out demons, to raise the dead, to heal the sick. It doesn't say that. It says to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So... You know, when we when we when we when we read Matthew 25 not too many weeks ago about you know when Jesus has the judgment you know and the sheep is on this side and the goats are on that side what's the deter what does he use as the determining factor whether you're a sheep or a goat remember Matthew 25 whether you're doing his wheel right but you know you were hungry. And you fed and me. And you fed me. You know, you were naked and you clothed me. You know, you were in prison and you came to visit me. You were sick and, you, and, you know, you came to, to visit, etc. So, that's the practical aspect of ministry is helping people, seeing the need. And meeting the need. And then meeting the need, right? Uh, putting others first. Yourself but, behind. But now, listen, in the last days... I mean, do they... Like before the close of probation, yeah. these things are going to occur again. And that is when we will go back to doing exactly that. Because we're going to need the help. And we're going to be looking, we're going to be looking after each other. We're going to be seeing that each of us has food to eat right. or a warm, dry place to sleep. I mean, these things are going to occur. And so, well, the question it begs the question: Then, what can we do? We do? Let's not wait for a crisis to occur. No. What can we do now? And it's really a matter of our. our well, we do. Uh, we are doing things. Yeah, we are doing things, but it's a matter of keeping that before the group, so that we all come to a place in our thinking that job number one is looking for and finding needs. people that need, have needs, right? and then trying as best you, you can either as an individual or as a group, to meet that need uh, for that person. Because ultimately, what you're working toward is another person's eternal well-being. Right? As well as within the group, our own. And then you're trying to teach that person to also teach other people. Make disciples of all men, is what it says. You know? Teaching them to observe all things that I've taught you. Right? So you're just passing on the information and you're wanting them, you've heard this term before, uh, pay it forward, mm -hmm. that expression before. <clears throat> you know, that really is the Christian ideal okay. in terms of what, that's, that's a Christian precedent. You know, you experience something and because of your appreciation for that, you want to pay it forward. So you want to do something good. But, but you don't want to wait for somebody to do something good for you 
to do something good for somebody else. Somebody's got to start it. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, as a, you, that starts in your life when you become a believer. When you become a believer, that's, that is what is initiated in your heart, looking for and helping others. Okay? And then using the gifts. When God has you in a, a, a place where a different interpretation needs to, uh, you know, language needs to be interpreted, you're right there, ready to be used. Uh, somebody needs healing. Somebody needs to be raised from the dead. I mean, a circumstance may come up where if God is going to be glorified, see, that's the, that's the key. The healing and the casting and the raising, all these miracles that occur, they're not designed to, to have uh, attention and focus put on you, right, or me, but who receives the glory and the honor? It should be God. Yeah, God is the one that receives the glory and the honor. You know, a lot of times with these... He's the one that does the cure in any way. Absolutely. You're Absolutely. just a tool. And see, there, people have to recognize that because... What do you have today out there? You got people that are put up on these pedestals because supposedly, you know, they heal people and cast out demons and different things, and it becomes a, uh, you know, I'm so talented and I'm so great, you know, look, look, you know, look up to me and send me your money, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm worth the, you know, I'm worth it. It's that's not it at all. It's not about the individual. It's about whether you can bring glory and honor to God in heaven. And so if he has you in a place where that can be accomplished, then he will, through the Holy Spirit, use you to, to accomplish some incredible thing. This is what Jesus did on a daily basis. He went around glorifying his Father, working uh, miracles every day, every day. Because you know that he was going to give the glory to his Father. That's what it really is all about. So. Let's go back to this for a second. Meet the needs. Now, Joe Olson, during his Houston thing, they asked, he, his place would have held 16,000 people. They, they, they could have taken as many as 16,000 people. And he says, no, we can't do that. Our place is flooding. Well, these, these some people that was no, there that. and watched this and videoed this thing and said, no, your place did not flood. <laughs> It's nowhere near flooding. He, and then he backpedals. He said, oh, what I meant to say was we was afraid that it was going to flood. Is the reason he didn't take them in. He didn't want them. Here is, here oh, is so the they, they wanted him to open up his yeah. facility. For his them, yeah. facility to, For them. To and he wouldn't do it. So here you're talking about someone that's, that's probably making $100,000 a week. Probably more than that. And, and, and yet... He wouldn't reach out to help others. No, we're afraid that if we take his trash in, they'll tear up everything we've got. They'll destroy it. There's a great little story that I read. He's got, I, read. I think, three different homes, five airplanes yeah. to fly around in. I read, I read a great little story back in uh, the 1980s or 90s. I can't remember when I got all of it. But it's called the Life Saving Station. Anybody ever hear that? Life saving station? Seems like I have, but I don't remember. <laughs> there was a, uh, it might be online somewhere, I don't know, but you look it up sometime. But it's about this group of people that they had a light, you know, it was, they were in a community where there was a lighthouse and they had this, this, this group, uh, this little kind of run down place, and it was called the life saving station. And when they would get a call, you know, somebody out in, in trouble in the water, they would take their little, you know, boat that was kind of messed up a little bit and they run it out there and it, it would help people, right? Well, obviously as the community grew, the interest in helping people, the interest in the life-saving station became more, more prevalent and so they built a new facility and they got new, you know, great, better equipment and whatnot and they would routinely go out and they would uh, uh, save people that were in distress. Well, what would happen, of course, when you save somebody, you know, you, you bring them in and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're really tattered looking. They're soaking wet usually and they're, they're you know, not uh, looking their best, of course. And so eventually what they did, the, some people on the, on the uh, Life Saving Station Committee, they came together and they said, well, look, you know, we... We don't, when we bring these people in, let's designate a certain spot over here uh, to, you know, to, to 
work to process them because we don't want them messing up, you know, other parts of the facility. And eventually it, it ended up getting to the place where people thought that, you know, we have such a nice facility here, we don't want to bring people in to mess it up. And so uh, interest, it became less and less uh, of an urgency to go out and save people because they didn't want to get their facility messed up and <laughs> that kind of thing. And so this is the kind of thing that happens. We, we start to look at things from a different perspective and the original idea of saving people that are in distress from the sea, in this case, uh, takes a back, back seat. That's what we can't allow to happen as a believer in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be about the mission. It has to be about souls for the kingdom. And as we minister, we bring glory and honor to God. That has to be the motive. Okay. Give him the credit for it, too. He has to get the credit. Because he is the one who does it. So. Okay, so uh, anybody else want to give a final comment? That's pretty much our study for today. <coughs> Uh, something to really contemplate and keep in mind as you go throughout your day and your weeks and so forth. So, every person that you run into, just try to ask yourself this question, uh, whether you're working with them or whatever it might be. Um, what does eternity look like for them? What does eternity, you know, where do, do they, you know, where are they going to end up, do you think? Well, remember too, every person you need, meet is in need of something. And they're going to be, that person is going to be lost or saved. Okay? And that's, you know, that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty blatant concept. But if you just ask that question and then see what God can do to work through you in planting some seeds that might be some encouragement to move them in a positive direction. He's waiting to work through us. He is. Are we willing to let him work through us? That's right. We get so distracted, so engrossed in our own little lives at times, we forget about the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is the mission of the body of believers. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, next week, <coughs> um, the, the um, yeah, of course, the 22nd of this month, I believe, is the Day of Atonement, September. And, of course, the 12th uh, began the, see, what's today's date? Uh, the 16th. Yeah, so the 12th began the, the trumpets, you know, 10 days of trumpets, and then culminating with the, uh, the last day there with the Yom Kippur. So next week, we'll get into looking at a little bit of that before we go. And then, of course, the following week after that, uh, we're just going to go into the book of Revelation. Okay. So next week, if you want to study up on, on something, uh, the trumpets and the Day of Atonement. So. All right. We'll go from there. Um, <clears throat> one thing that is interesting, I'll, I'll mention it more specifically, but the United Nations, you know, every year they come out in September with this theme for the, the next year. And uh, next week I'll mention what that is. Um, but this, this, the theme for 2017 apparently is uh, uh, something dealing with peace and safety. That's the theme for the year, peace and safety. So I'll, I'll have a little list of some of the preceding years and we'll see how it all fits together. But, yeah. but uh, just kind of interesting that... that uh, this year's peace and safety. And what does the Bible tell us when they declare peace and safety? Sudden destruction. Yeah, so might just be another little indicator. All right. Hey, Ken, would you like to have closing prayer for us today? Yeah. Okay. Lord, we love you. We sure thank you for this Sabbath day. We ask that you watch over us. Bless our uh, little church and to help us to understand what you have us to understand. Help us to reach out to those in need. Yes. And uh, we ask that you make sure that we come back each week so we can learn the things you want us to learn. And I 
thank you and ask you in the name of Jesus, amen, except we would like to give thanks for the food and the fellowship that we have after after our sermon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. Appreciate all your comments. And uh, as always, uh, glad that you're here with us. And we hope to see you next week. Same place, same time. Church. Oh, yes. Have a great week, everybody.